everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, second part of our five part webinar series on trauma informed approaches to after school programs. Um, I'm Tony Iniguez, education specialist with the Marshfield Clinic, um, foster care medical home. Um, and with me is Jennifer Smith. Yep, I'm with uh, the Marshall Clinic Center for Community Outreach, working as an after school program manager with the Youth Net program, as well as the Wisconsin After School Network. So again, just a couple of reminders that uh, the webinar is archived and so you'll be receiving an email uh, after it's um, uploaded and you'll be able to access uh, this webinar at a later time. So we will begin. So the objectives for today are to understand the importance of stress to learning, um, to understand the importance of attachment to healthy development. Uh, hopefully you'll learn some strategies to strengthen attachment, uh, understand the significant significance of attunement, and hopefully by the end of the session you'll be able to apply some of the knowledge on attachment and attunement uh, to the after school environment. Um, so one of the first things that we want to talk about is stress. And so you see the picture there, the question is, is good stress? Is there such thing as good stress? You know, is it an oxymoron? And Dr. Bruce Perry talks about uh, this concept of the learning window, which we'll, we'll get to that um, shortly in a few more slides. Um, but we know that uh, there is such a thing as good stress. Um, stress has to be, uh, it's, it's something that's challenging or it's unfamiliar uh, when we consider good stress. Stress and setbacks that are buffered by present and attentive caregivers, teachers, friends, or family is considered good stress. Uh, the other thing that when we consider moderate or and controlled stress in the presence of loving caregivers, uh, it results in resilience, which ultimately that's the goal uh, of our society. We want to be a resilient society. We want to be a resilient community. And so one of the ways that we can contribute to that is by being able to control and, and, and to, uh, you know, allow children uh, small doses of stress. Uh, the opposite of that would be what we call like a helicopter parent that, you know, does everything for the child. Um, and that child will not uh, develop some of those resilient um, components that they need to be able to navigate through life. So optimal doses of stress are vital to learning. We know that. Um, we also know that it is not a one dose fits all. And that's the one thing that we really want to make sure that all of uh, individuals that work with children know, know that, that, um, you know, we have to adjust. And, and we have to adjust it based on uh, the child's mental state and where they are, you know, have they experienced trauma or neglect. Um, or have they experienced, uh, you know, a, a very uh, a life full of lots of attentive and, and loving caregiving? And then optimal stress is developmentally dependent, or what we call stage dependent. And we'll discuss some of these concepts as we navigate through this. Um, so just like when you look at the story of Goldilocks and the Three Little Bears, uh, we know that, you know, stress, if it's too low, uh, or challenges, if they're too, too, they're too, too, too low, uh, we have minimal learning or no learning in some cases. Uh, if we have stress that is too high or if the concepts or the things that we're trying to teach to children are, are, are too challenging, then it results into, in frustration and breakdown. And so really what we want to do is we want to find the just the right amount of, of stress or unfamiliar. And so we know that learning flourishes with just the right amount of stress or unfamiliar. So let's look, some of you know, have seen the yerkes dotson law, uh, this, this little bell curve. And so when we look at this slide, we notice that uh, on the y-axis, we're looking at performance. And on the x-axis, we're looking at stress. So as we uh, increase stress, okay, we also increase performance. And so this is looking at a typical uh, well-regulated adult or a child, uh, again, someone who has, uh, you know, developed some of those resilient um, um, capabilities. Uh, and so in order for us to be to perform at our at our at our best, you know, there has to be a little bit of stress. Uh, for those of you that are familiar that, that like to exercise, this is a very similar concept that, you know, when you think about strength training, that if you don't do enough weight, uh, you're not going to see the progress. And so here we see they're right in the middle of this. This is where op this is our optimum optimum stress occurs. OK, and so, again, if it's not challenging enough. There's very little learning. As we challenge or as we increase stress, then we get to what we call optimal learning. And that's where we, uh, we, we encompass, you know, we come to fatigue. Now, if we continue to increase stress, then we enter the area of exhaustion. Uh, and then again, if we continue to add stress or challenge, then it becomes we have high levels of anxiety for children. And when you think about um, athletics, this is where you have injury. 
Now let's look at a child that is hyper responsive to stress. So again, someone who's experienced a significant amount of trauma or neglect in their uh, in their life, uh, you notice that their bell curve is a lot lower, okay, and the levels of stress that they can optimally, uh, you know, learn under are, are very, very mo uh, small compared to a typical child. So you can see that where this for a neurotypical child would be very unchallenging, uh, they would be, they, they have no learning happening here. For a child who is uh, dealing with trauma and neglect, um, that can be in some cases, extremely uh, exhausting or even, again, anxiety-inducing. And so a couple things to notice about this is, again, less stress, okay, or less challenges for children that are dealing with, um, with uh, trauma and neglect. But then the other important thing to notice is that their optimal or their peak performance is a lot lower. And so these children are not going to be able to learn um, or to perform as highly as children that, again, have had the privilege of, of a well upbringing. And I would add to that, it also fits in with their ability to function in a social capacity. So children who are playing um, group games outside are not going to tolerate um, very much stress in terms of kids maybe not following the rules. Someone who is well regulated is better able to vocalize, you know, I'm not happy with the way that you're playing the game because you're not following the rules and will be able to tolerate a larger window of that, whereas a child who is more dysregulated and is hyper-responsive to those stresses is going to act out much quicker. And so you'll think, think about this. So in, in this scenario, you have a child that maybe, you know, someone is, again, is providing some sort of stress, and it might be in the form of a joke or teasing. A child that is well-regulated is going to be able to take a lot more of that teasing before they actually break down Whereas a child who is, again, dealing with um, significant trauma, neglect, um, poor upbringing, they're only going to, you know, they're going to see it as bullying a lot sooner than someone who uh, is well-regulated. So the next area that it really kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the, the Yerkes-Dotson um, uh, bell curve there is learning about mental state. And when we want to, when we think about mental state, uh, we're addressing mental state not only with the children that we're working with, but our own personal mental state. And that's the, you know, I think that that's a very important thing to understand is that depending on where we are uh, mentally, uh, we are going to either help children learn and function well, or we are going to contribute to their dysregulation and to their poor behavior. Now, there are three main functions that our mental state uh, control or that really depend on our mental state. And so the first one is our functional IQ or how smart we are, and this is what we call cognition. Uh, we know that the more upset we are, the dumber we become. Okay, and this is, you know, I'm sure everyone out there can think of a scenario where, you know, if you're if you're nice and calm, if you're in a good mental state, you are at your smartest. You can function well. The minute you start to become stressed, uh, you make poor choices, um, you make snap decisions, etc which comes down to the next uh, function, which is uh, our behavior or our responses. Uh, whether they're good, <clears throat> bad, or whether we check out. Uh, you know, again, if you're in a good mental state and somebody, you know, says something to you, uh, you're going to respond to it differently uh, depending on, you know, again, if you're in a good mental state, if you're in a poor mental state, uh, you might view that as threatening or insulting. And then the third function is storing memory or what we call processing. And we know that if we're not in the, in, in, in the right mental state, uh, all of the information that we are given or provided with that we read, we will not process it. Okay? You will not store it. Uh, you might remember it for a few, for a few moments, uh, but you will not be able to recall it uh, later on uh, in life or in the day. And so we really see this manifest itself with children that we work with. So children that, again, have been traumatized or neglected, uh, their mental state uh, get locked in these, uh, what we call an alarm, fear, or terror. And so you might explain to them uh, a concept, and, and, and you'll reaffirm, and, and they'll, you know, they'll tell you, yes, I get it, I understand it. Two minutes later, they'll look at you like, you're, like, they, like you never mentioned it to them before. That's because it never got stored into long-term memory because they were not in the correct or in the uh, optimal mental state. Uh, again, children that uh, are experiencing trauma and neglect, uh, their, their 
ability to uh, to read uh, nonverbal cues is also limited, and external cues, and then, like I just mentioned earlier, content. So let's look um, briefly at um, uh, this, uh, we call our mental state or our arousal continuum. And uh, again, this is a continuum that Dr. Bruce Perry, uh, through the Child Trauma Academy, um, really bases a lot of his um, training on, both for um, educators and for, for therapists. And so the first mental state that we all like to be in is, is our call mental state. And this is a mental state in which we can be reflective uh, and we can think abstractly. Uh, the next mental state is alert. And this is a mental state in which we are, our thinking is a little bit more concrete. Uh, the third one is alarm, which become more emotional. Uh, fear, uh, our, mental be our mental state becomes more um, reactive. And then the third one, and the or the fifth one, the final one is terror, which our, our mental state or our thinking becomes more reflexive. And I'll let Jen kind of walk you through a scenario that I think will uh, uh, show this very clearly for you. So if you envision yourself sitting in a classroom working with some students, an after-school program, you're working on homework, it's a pretty typical Wednesday afternoon, and while you're working you hear some kids quietly moving around the building, you would be in a calm mental state. It's a typical day, the noises are familiar, um, the setting is overall calm and usual for you. Um, but then you hear some louder noises, you hear some footsteps in the hall, and now you're a little more alert, like something's going on outside of this classroom, I need to kind of start paying a little bit more attention, and you will start losing some of your ability to focus on what you're working on, what you're helping the students with their homework. So now the noises continue to escalate and you hear door slamming in the hallway and so now you're alarmed. There's clearly something going on and your focus is shifting. You're no longer able to really process um, thinking. You're starting to become more emotional and feeling changes in your body. Your heart rate's maybe escalating because things are not typical. Um, now you hear kids running and yelling in the hallway and so you enter a state of fear. And then finally, the classroom that you're sitting in, the door flies open and bangs against the wall, and now you're in a state of terror. So as the environment changed and heightened around you, you moved through um, the mental states until you ended in terror. Yeah. And so here we kind of, you know, we, we kind of break it down. You know, we talk, one of the things that we really try to teach the kids that we work with is that we have two general areas that our brain can function in. And so one is what we call the reasoning zone or our learning zone. And then the other one is our survival zone. And so children, then again, you know, we talked about, um, you know, brain development at the last session and, and how children that are dysregulated kind of get stuck into these, uh, these states over here. Um, so they're not able to learn and process because the type of thinking that they're able to access is, is emotional at best. But in a lot of cases, it's reactive and reflexive, okay? And so in order for us to be able to reason with children and to be able to teach uh, and for them to be able to learn, they have to be in these two mental states right here. They have to be able to think concretely. They have to be able to reflect and think abstractly. Uh, and so we're going to show you some interventions and some tools um, to help some of these children navigate from these mental states into the ones over here. And then the other thing you want to consider is your own personal mental state, too. That if you are, um, you know, upset, if you're alarmed, if you're agitated, if you're stressed out, your thinking is emotional, okay? And so if, if your own mental state is not that of calm or alert, you're not going to be able to help these children navigate uh, through this um, spectrum or through this um, continuum. And so it's very important that, you know, the tools that we teach you and that we utilize that we practice them as well, you know, so that we're not, you know, the concept of do as I say, not as I do, we want to avoid that. We want it to be more of do as I do. Right. And I would like to add, um, many of us are familiar with the saying, I, you know, I walked into the room and I could cut the tension with a knife. That's because as mammals, we are attuned to other mammals' nervous systems and mental states. So if you are in alarm and students walk into your classroom, they will sense that. Probably not on a conscious level, but it will have an impact on their ability to regulate. So by you being in a calm mental state, 
it allows the students when they enter your program to have something to anchor to that is calm and stable, which will help facilitate their ability to regulate their own mental state. And the other thing to consider when we're looking at mental state is, uh, you know, we talked about our, our IQ, our functional IQ, or cognition. Um, when, when, you know, you take a typical uh, adult or, or, or teen, um, you know, when they're in a calm mental state, their IQ might be between 100 and 110. Um, once they enter a mental state of alertness, that IQ drops down about 10 points. Okay, and so think about that. When you're able to reflect, you're able to recall the things that maybe you've studied, past experiences, you're almost able to daydream a little bit. Okay, and so, so this is where you're at your most creative, um, most reflective. Um, and so again, we drop 10 points. Now when you, when you become alarmed, um, what happens is that those outer regions of the brain, so the cortex and the limbic brain, they kind of stop, you know, they stop firing a little bit um, and we start focusing more on those lower brain regions. And so your IQ here might be about, a, you know, another 10 points. Uh, you know, now you're looking at about a 90 IQ. Uh, now when you enter a mental state of fear, your IQ will drop down to, say, 80. Okay? And this is because we're only functioning on our midbrain and our brainstem region. This is about survival. And this is actually a good thing. Okay? It's called the survival brain or survival zone for a reason. This is part of the way we developed and the way we were able to survive um, as humans. Okay? So we want to be able to uh, react and, and, and depend on our reflexes in order to survive. But in order for that to happen, that means that these parts of the brain have to shut down. Um, and so by the time you get here, you might have a functional IQ of 70, okay, which is the cutoff for an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's not to, you know, it, it's, it's not, you know, not to judge or anything, but there's a specific reason why that IQ drops so low, and that's it's for survival of the species. Um, so we're going to move on to our next um, topic, which is attachment. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about attunement and, and encouragement. And so one of the things that we know that exceptional educators possess and, and anyone that works with children in an after-school setting, in a school setting, um, you are all educators. And so exceptional educators possess the skills and the will to connect and bond with children. Okay, so it's not, it's not strictly about, um, you know, having, the, you know, so you've you got to have the ability, but you also have to have the will to be able to do this and the want. So when we think of attachment, we know that healthy attachment equals healthy development. And we know that growth thrives with attachment. And so when we think of uh, growth, you know, think about your own personal, your own professional growth, okay, and how it is a lot more meaningful uh, when it's in the presence of those that you care about, okay, or that you have a connection with. So attachment really is all about our ability to form relationships. It's our ability to make connections to those around us. And it's about our ability to affiliate and relate and associate, whether it's through our culture, our peers, family, religion, uh, gender, neighborhood, school. Uh, and so we have to be able to provide our children in after-school settings uh, the ability to be able to affiliate. Uh, the other option for them, uh, for those of you that work in communities that happen to be maybe in more urban settings, uh, is, uh, you know, the other option for some of these kids is the affiliation towards gangs and towards um, bad relationships, okay? And so by providing, um, you know, good people that, that have the skills and the ability uh, to connect, uh, we're hopefully funneling some of those kids or preventing some of those kids from making those poor choices when it comes to affiliation. So again, attachment is an emotional bond to another person. We know that healthy attachment is vital to healthy development, and we know that uh, healthy attachment enhances learning. Uh, so if you have a good relationship with your teacher, you are going to learn a lot more and you're going to process a lot more than if you have a poor relationship with a teacher or with an after-school staff member. Okay, and that's just, again, that's just a fact. So here's some suggestions that we uh, can give to you that are very, very simple, but I think can, you know, make a huge impact on, on our ability to be able to connect and attach to, to our, the children we work with. The first thing is, you have to notice the good stuff that they do, okay? And, and you don't have to judge it. You don't have to say good job every time. All you can say is, I notice you put your coat on the coat hanger, or I notice that you're ready to listen, or I notice that uh, you walk quietly from 
this session to you know the next one. Um, and we really want to pay less attention to the mistakes of the poor choices. And really, this is a change that um, it's it's you know it's it's happening in the schools. Um, you know, and, and but this is something that we have to make a concerted effort. It's so easy to point out the obvious. It's so easy to say, you know, stop yelling or stop running or stop doing this. But again, you're you're noticing the poor choices and the poor behaviors versus noticing the things that they are doing well. And then value everyone's contribution to learning and development. So some ways to maybe institutionalize this a little bit in your after school programs, noticing the good stuff they do as an example, um, having a concrete system for recognizing the positive behavior that kids are displaying in the after school program. So one of the things that we do in the YouthNet program is we have some positive behavioral expectations. We have four overarching expectations be safe, trustworthy, accountable, respectful. And we have um, tangible stars that we hand out to participants. If we notice that they are being respectful of their peers, of the property, if they go out of the way to help somebody, if they sit down and get their homework out right away, we are able to acknowledge, you know, thank you for having a seat and getting right to work today. That was really awesome. And we give them um, stars, and then we have a star store, so then the kids can use those tangible rewards um, to purchase some items from the star store, so we know the entire staff is aware of those behavioral expectations, and we're all using the same language, and we are all reinforcing um, what we like to see with the students. Right. And as you consider implementing some of these um, PBIS, or positive behavioral um, interventions and supports, um, you want to think about um, making sure that when you do pick the your your um, you know your tiers that you're going to address, that the children know what the expectations are. You know, so that when we say trustworthiness, they know what that means. You have to you know you have to have concrete examples um, so that they you know kids want to do well if if you know if they know how. Um, so we have to make sure that we're also not uh, too ambiguous when we implement some of these um, interventions. Um, the other three things that, or the other two parts that are very important to, with attachment are empathy and compassion. And so one of the things we want you to consider, uh, first of all, are empathy and compassion the same thing? And then the second component is, are they inherent or learned traits? And we had some poll questions for these, but I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna skip them and we'll kind of give you the answers. And, and we know that empathy and compassion are not the same thing. They're, they're slightly similar, or similar, but they're different. And... Empathy and compassion are not inherent. So children are, are not born with these things. These are things that they are taught. And so when we look at some of the kids that are the most challenging in our programs, we some of us notice that they, you know, they show no empathy and they, they show no compassion. It is not that they're evil people. It's just that they, they've never been taught or, or they haven't seen those modeled in action. And so that's part of our job um, you know, to model and to teach these things. So let's look at empathy, and it's empathy is our ability to understand and share someone else's feelings, experiences, and emotions, while compassion is having a sympathetic awareness of others' distress, but really the key to this is the desire to alleviate it, okay? So empathy is not good enough for us. Uh, it's okay to kind of put yourself in their shoes, but now, you know, we got to take it a step further, is what can we do <clears throat> as a program to help alleviate that? And so hopefully, again, we're going to be providing some of those strategies for you. Uh, and just basic uh, general awareness of this, too, I think kind of helps with that. Um, the third component to um, having strong attachment with the kids that we work with is encouragement. And, and again, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure that all of you know that, you know, this is, again, a, a basic concept that, um, you know, we, we get more with, uh, with, with honey than with vinegar, right? But encouragement is really about giving them hope, um, providing them with praise, uh, a lot of our children that, again, come from challenging environments, they rarely hear praise, okay? They, they, they hear all of the, the poor things that they do. Those are the things that get noticed, whether it's by the classroom teacher or by the caregivers at home. Um, and also encouragement is a way for us to provide some guidance, okay? So think about your own professional and your own personal life, okay? Who does not like to hear that they're doing a good job, okay? Um, Jen and I love some of the emails that we received from the last session. Absolutely. And, and you know, really not only do they make us feel good, but it, it makes us work harder. You know, it, it kind of gives us a sense of purpose and, 
and we work hard as it is anyway. But, <laughs> um, but, but encouragement is, is something that we, we really don't want to uh, underestimate. Now, how do we teach and model empathy? Okay, so here are some key phrases that, you know, they're kind of like little canned phrases, but, you know, if you memorize these, um, they're going to help you so much. So see, see some of the things that you can say. You know, so when a child does a, it makes a poor decision, you know, you can say, I bet there's a very good reason why. Um, even as simple, something like a child throws a book across the room, okay? There's nothing wrong with saying, I bet there's a very good reason why you threw that book across the room. And to that child, that means a lot, okay? And there is a very good reason why they did that. Um, help me understand why is another phrase that you can utilize. Um, help me understand how you're feeling. So if you notice that the child, you know, they throw the book because you know, they're like, well, I'm just, I'm mad, I'm angry, okay? So now the next thing that you can say to them is, well, help me understand how you're feeling or why you're feeling um, that. Uh, you can also help them sort out their feelings without telling them how they feel. Okay, so you don't want to necessarily say, oh, well, this is what you're feeling, but you can say, you know, sounds like you feel this, or if I'm hearing you right, uh, you are saying this, okay? You want to make sure that you're reaffirming their feelings and, their, and, and, and you're not necessarily providing them for how they should feel. Uh, let me see if I understand you, okay? So again, these are phrases that we can use to clarify uh, or to get more understanding as to how uh, and what they're going through. So as an example, uh, we have shifted our language in our after-school program to asking kids, you know, what's going on with you today and how can I help you? So as an example, we had a young lady who came in highly dysregulated, was loud, and she kind of burst into the after-school program. And I imagine every one of you can envision a child doing the very same thing in one of your programs. And she was loud and boisterous and um, kind of physically all over the place. And so I pulled her to the side and I, I said, you know, what's going on with you today? It really seems like there might be something that happened with you. How can I help you right now? And she and I sat down and this 11-year-old girl unloaded stress that would be difficult for an adult to manage. You know, a family was moving for the third time in the school year. You know, she has a parent in prison. She was just going on and on and eventually broke down and just started crying about all of the things that she was dealing with in her life. And so I said, I understand why you are behaving the way you are behaving because I would be stressed out if I was dealing with those things. And we problem solved. What can we do right now to help you feel a little bit more calm despite the fact that you have all these things going on in your life. And part of our plan then was each day when she came to the after school program, we would sit down for five minutes and just connect because having that time and having that understanding and empathic response with another, with an adult helped her to regulate a little bit. So it's not perfect. Every, you know, every day she came in, it wasn't like all of a sudden everything was great. She still struggles with regulation, but at least we've made a little bit of headway and we see progress in the way that she handles herself when she arrives. Yep. And we'll continue and you'll continue to see more progress. And, you know, the other important thing to consider there is that, you know, this child is, it, they, they, she knows now that she has someone, an adult, um, that she can have a healthy relationship with. And so, again, we're teaching and we're modeling healthy relationships, healthy interactions, um, healthy ways to, of dealing with our body feeling a little funny or weird, which, you know, a lot of our kids, mm -hmm. they can't tell you, you know, they, they, fe they feel anxiety, they feel stress, but they can't um, verbalize that for us. Um, so now, you know, what are some of the responses that we can provide to them with compassion? Okay, so everyone feels like that sometimes. So once this child has opened up to you and has says, you know, says I'm upset or I'm angry or I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared, um, you can reassure them and, and, and make them, you know, Again, you're, you're, you're helping create affiliation. They know that they're not alone on this. Okay? They probably already feel um, you know, stigmatized. Um, they might feel singled out. They might feel like they're different. Um, and so by, by just you sharing with them that this is something that an emotion or a feeling that you've had yourself, it, just, it, it gives them a little bit of comfort um, you know, for them to maybe be able to, to process a little bit more what they're going through. Uh, and then you can offer suggestions. So you can say, when I felt like that, I, 
did this. And so this is a great scenario. This is a great place where you can introduce, you know, deep breathing. You could say, when I felt like that, I took five deep breaths, okay, or I closed my eyes and I pictured uh, the ocean waves and then I took five deep breaths. So these are, these are, this is an opportunity for you to offer some of those um, mindfulness activities, those, those strategies that they uh, have not been taught um, that happened to me before. Or so-and-so had the same problem once. Do you want to hear what they did? And so maybe you can relate it to a child or another person their age, close to their age, uh, without necessarily giving out a name or anything or specifics. You can say, I had another student, you know, another girl who's the same age who went through the same thing. Do you want to know how she dealt with this or what were some of her solutions to the problem? Um, and then again, reassuring them. I bet we can figure a way to work this out. Let them tell you how they feel. Just listen. And then you can help them work through it in many cases without necessarily, uh, you know, doing it for them. Um, these prompts are basically offering um, opportunities, again, for attachment, but also opportunities for them to be able to, pro uh, to problem solve and, and, and uh, develop skills to be able to that they can carry with them throughout life. So let's look at traditional discipline. Okay, and we know that traditional discipline is not about compassion. Okay, so traditional discipline tends to be more punitive. Um, traditional discipline is not about shaping behaviors, but in a lot of times it's about forcing changes in behavior. We try to use our authority as adult figures um, to force kids to. Um, to do things. Okay, so again, we're not modeling or offering healthy alternatives. We're just using our power and our status um, to, to really try to force those changes. Traditional discipline is not about teaching appropriate responses. And again, we mentioned earlier about, the, you know, the concept of do as I say, not as I do. Instead, discipline, uh, you want to discipline with compassion. Um, we want to show you this um, kind of short video. And this is a trauma-based relational intervention. Um, it's a it's a module that they use Dr. Purvis out of uh, Texas Christian University. They you can do some training on this if you'd like. Um, but the reason, the purpose why we want to show you the video is just um, it just kind of shows you how uh, all of us have probably reacted to uh, misbehaviors. Traditional discipline simply doesn't work with our kids. You give that back to her right now. Neither does shaming or belittling a child, as these actors demonstrate. I am sick and tired of you acting like a little brat. Can't you just do anything right that you get up and go to your room? Punishment is the least effective way to change behavior that there is. And in fact, it's very often counterproductive. It actually uh, makes things worse because it reactivates all those old demons, all those old traumas. And you stay in your room until I tell you you can come out. Correcting only really works effectively when we're connected or when we honor the connection. Instead of sending the child away, TBRI teaches you to correct behavior while keeping the child close and connected. Honey, people are not for hurting. All right. Um, so you can see that with that scenario, and, and again, I, you know, I've been guilty of, of, of discipline my own children that way and sometimes. But one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, in the first scenario where the, the, the parent was, uh, their, her mental state was that of anger and, and, and being upset. Um, and so with children that are challenging, um, acting in those ways, all it's going to do is, is um, it's going to dysregulate them further. Okay? You're basically going to re-engage all of those bad memories and, and, and their responses either to, uh, to fight or to or to or to flee to shut down. Um, you want to see how you discipline? Uh, ask a child to role play with toys, and and you can ask them. You know, you be mommy, and 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 I'll be the the child, and and you'll get a clear picture of, of how how it is that you deal with discipline. Now, encouragement. We know that it's very very powerful. We process more when it comes from someone with whom we relate with. Um, think about um, Facebook. Okay, so. Most of us or most of you that are on Facebook, um, you have a certain circle uh, of friends that if they post anything, you take it as gospel. Okay, you don't question it. Um, and, and so, you know, we kind of tend to isolate ourselves with Facebook and, and, and our thinking and our ideas, but we do that because it gives us comfort. Okay, and so um, if we can surround ourselves with people that we uh, feel attached or relation, uh, relation that we can relate to, we're going to learn and process more. 
Uh, encouragement and praise is more impactful and healthier than threats. And then pleasurable and successful activities, uh, they help encourage practice and repetition. If something is fun, if, if we're good at something, we want to practice it more. And we know that through practice and through repetition, that's how we create memory, that's how we learn. Okay? And so part of pleasure is affirmation. So again, encouraging children, no matter how trivial or small it might seem, to them it could be, you know, it, it, it means a lot to them. So here's some examples of how we deal with, um, you know, discipline, but, you know, you're encouraging as well. Um, so one of the things is stating the obvious, okay? So hitting your sister is hurtful. I bet there's a reason. Help me understand why. And then I bet you know of a better way to respond. Okay, so now here you're engaging the child. Um, you know, you're, you're helping them um, be able to kind of reach those outer parts of their brain to be able to, to, to use their thinking brain if they are in a good mental state. Uh, if we've yelled at them, uh, if they're upset, you saw the little girl that slammed the door, <clears throat> this is not going to work. Okay, because she's, she's going to be in that survival brain versus that learning brain mode. Um, and then again, if they give you some ideas, that is a great way to respond. So we know that uh, encouragement is important. Um, so now how can we uh, encourage reflection too? So you've been really focused on your work. What's helping you concentrate today? Or I've noticed that you are remembering to put your name on all of your work this week. What's your strategy for remembering that? Okay, so two things are happening here. One, you're noticing, okay? But secondly, you're actually asking them to reflect as to their success. And if they're able to reflect on that, uh, they're able to utilize it later on uh, when they might be in, a, in, in, in not uh, the, the proper mental state. So these questions, again, can help students become more aware of their own actions and behaviors, which will lead to more positive behaviors and continued improvement. And so this is a wonderful quote by, uh, quote by Dr. Bruce Perry. The cycle of learning is fueled by relationships. And we know that encouragement enriches the pleasure of discovery. So let's kind of shift our focus now to attunement. Okay? And really this is all about age versus stage. And um, attunement, it's also about nonverbal communication. Okay? So attunement is about our skills and our abilities to notice, um, again, not words, but actions and body language. So there are three things that we have to consider. So number one, we have to be aware of those nonverbal cues. Okay. And so one of the ways that we can become aware is by being attentive, okay, paying attention, not sitting, you know, on your cell phone or, or only hanging out with, with the, the adults in the group, okay. So pay attention to those nonverbal cues. And then we also have to have the ability to interpret or decipher those nonverbal cues, okay. So if a child starts to maybe fidget or slump or sigh, um, we know what that potentially could mean for that child. And then having the ability and the skill to respond to those nonverbal cues. Uh, and that's where, you know, learning some of these mindfulness activities, these um, somatosensory strategies, uh, those are ways that we can respond in a positive way to help children navigate, again, from a poor mental state to a more optimal mental state. So we talked to our after-school staff about attunement really being with itness. So the ability to be with it when you're engaged with kids and activities. So you're on the playground and you are participating in activities and you become aware that there are two boys playing Foursquare whose body language is indicating that they're not seeing eye to eye with what's going on in the game. So interpreting that and then engaging, the staff engaging in the Foursquare game, maybe walking over there and getting in line to participate, maybe redirecting some of the behavior or stopping the game to clarify rules before um, the situation escalates. So really it's being engaged and paying attention and then responding rather than letting the situation get out of hand. And when you consider, you know, being aware, right? So one of the way aware and interpretation if we if we have that bond with the child already so if we've connected with that child we're going to be more likely to be able to understand all those little nonverbal cues that they give us um, in most cases you know kids we consider that they are explosive okay so the kids that are hyper uh, responsive or that they're highly dysregulated we say they're very explosive or you know they go from zero to 100 but in a lot of cases there's little cues there that we just haven't noticed Okay? And again, it could be something as simple as, as fidgeting 
or you know a child starts to become hypervigilant. They start to look around because they start to become you know a little bit stressed out. Um, so those are little things that you know if you increase attachment, okay, with those children, if you strengthen those bonds and those relationships, then that's also going to help with uh, your ability to to become attuned with that child. And so think about an infant, right? And so parents that are attentive and attuned, they can tell what the child is babbling. Okay, mm -hmm. where to many of us, you know, we're like, oh, it just sounds like a bunch of, <laughs> you know, different words. But that parent is attuned to their child's, um, to their um, developing language. Okay, and so we want to be able to do the same thing with the children that we serve in the after school setting. So attunement, the second component is about stage, right? So so one is, the, the first component was about body language and nonverbal. Um, this one is more about understanding that there's a difference between developmental stage um, and uh, chronological age, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Okay, so you want to understand the, the, where they are developmentally, uh, but also you also want to be aware of their mental state. Uh, so we consider that all children born on the same day, okay, the same year, uh, the same month, uh, they are the same chronological age. Okay, however, you take that same group of children that are born on the same day, same year, um, same month, they are not all the same developmental age. Okay? And so we have to stop treating, we have to stop putting all of our kids into like these age groups or chronological groups. We have to really take, look hard and consider where they are developmentally. Okay, so again, you wouldn't put this poor little guy on that treadmill and say, here, go run some, you know, run some sprints for me. They don't have uh, the developmental uh, capabilities or ability yet, okay, both physically uh, and cognitively. So I want you to look at this quote by, um, or this uh, study um, out of New York, Williamsburg, Williamsville, New York, that says that children with complex trauma may be developmentally less than half their chronological age. And I'm sure that many of you can picture uh, several students, the, 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 you know, the ones that you work with, that you, know, you look at their age and you're like, they're eight years old, but they act like a four-year-old. Okay? Or a 15-year-old that acts like a seven or eight-year-old. Uh, this is very, very common. Uh, with children that, again, that have experienced complex trauma. But what do we do about it? Okay, so one of the things that you can do is you can develop, uh, you know, a small tool like this that looks at academic or skill, uh, looks at social and emotional, and we look at those separately, okay? And so this might work in a, in a way where you can bring in all of the individuals that maybe have interactions with this child, and you can say, you can discuss where are they developmentally uh, for this category or this domain. And so here we have a fifth grade male who's 11 years old and academically skill wise, you know, he's at, he's at the appropriate um, developmental stage, fifth grade. He does really well in sports, but gets distracted easily. So one of the things that we could do is incorporate movement into some of these academic activities to kind of maybe help him focus because this child really loves movement um, and maybe fine or gross motor movement. Okay, and so you might incorporate maybe a standing desk for this kid would help him focus because just the, ha having the ability to rock back and forth a little bit um, helps some kids process information more, more easily. Um, this child we look at, we decided that socially they're a third grade level and they're a pleaser. Okay, so one of the things that we might do is encourage self-care for this child because we don't want them to be walked all over. You know, we want them to be able to say, um, you know, no, I don't want to do that, or, you know, I'd prefer to do this instead of that. Uh, emotionally, this child is, even at a younger age, so second grade, very reactive with minimal setbacks. So one of the things that we might do is, you know, if, if this is in a school setting, you might rely, you know, you might basically seek the help or the advice of the second grade teacher and say, you know, what are some strategies that I can use for this child at our second um, grade level? Uh, because then once that child meets those expectations that they can move on to third grade and then fourth grade and so on. Okay, We know that development is sequential. Okay, You cannot skip levels just like that little infant can't, you know, you can't just throw them on a treadmill and expect them to run. The same thing happens with all of these domains uh, when we're dealing with, um, with children. So here's another scenario. We have a female, fifth grader, 11 years old, Academically, she does really well. Again, she's at, eight, at grade level, so developmentally she's at fifth grade. She excels in reading or in writing and art, 
And so one of the things that you could do is incorporate journaling or art into some of these other interventions that you might use here for social and emotional. Uh, socially, she's seventh grade, so she's way above her, her, her age, and she seeks male approval. This is already a big red flag for most of us, isn't it? Um, this is a girl who's in danger of, of obviously potentially being abused. Um, and so one of the things that we want to do, you know, some of the interventions would be to encourage self-care. We want to model healthy interactions, you know. So it's very important for those male role models that interact with this student um, that basically they are modeling appropriate contact, appropriate language, um, you know, that we're not basically encouraging, you know, this um, older social behavior. Um, and then obviously in some cases you might have to seek the, uh, the, the advice of a, of a counselor or a social worker. Um, and then emotional, she's fourth grade, which is age typical. Again, these are ranges. And then lastly, we'll look at this fifth grade male, 11th year, 11 year old, uh, math and reading. Math, he's at second grade. Reading, he's at third grade, gets frustrated, uh, distracted. Um, socially, he's third grade again. He loves role playing. Uh, emotionally, he's very reactive. And so this would be a child that in my opinion, would be would probably experience severe trauma and neglect, probably you know, probably through most of their life. Um, but this could also happen with one severe traumatic event. Okay, so this is a child that academically we have to meet them at the second grade level. Um, so if the teacher is sending fifth grade math, this child is not going to. Uh, you know, you guys are not miracle workers, so you're not going to, you're not going to get, you're not going to get that child to navigate from sixth, gr second grade to fifth grade in a semester or in a, in, in a school year. Um, so we have to meet that child academically in math at second grade. Once he meet, once he does well there, then we go to third grade, fourth grade, and eventually, you know, we'd like to get to fifth grade. Um, same thing for reading. Okay. We don't want to, uh, again, introduce fifth grade reading. We want to, uh, make those adaptations at the third grade level. And sadly for this child, in most cases, um, they're not going to make that gap up because, you know, again, we know, we learned from our last session that our brain develops, most of the critical brain development happens between conception and age three. And so by the time they're in fifth grade and they're this far back, uh, if this is because of continuing neglect uh, or poverty or trauma at home, it'll be very difficult for this, this child to, to, um, to, to make those gains. Now, it doesn't mean that we give up on them and we say, well, that's just where they're at and, and too bad. No, what it means is that we have to make those adaptations um, and meet them where they are developmentally. So for those of you that are, again, have a teaching background, you heard of the word, the buzzword differentiation. That means that you have to adapt uh, your lessons or whatever it is that you're trying to teach, you have to modify it um, to the child, whether it's um, based on physical limitations, um, intellectual limitations, um, and in this case, we're looking at, you know, trauma uh, or, thing, or limitations that are caused by trauma. So, you know, whether it's academically, socially, and emotionally. Um, we have, we did add this, um, this little guide here. Um, it's, it's uh, you can upload it, it's on, uh, it'll be on the archive. Uh, but it's just it's just a brief guide that kind of gives you some very very general excuse me descriptions of where some of these children are in these groupings and but you have to understand that you know all children are different so you can't you know, again you don't want to pigeonhole children into these um, categories but it just kind of gives you an idea so that you know maybe your expectations are not appropriate okay and so you know when we think of a child you know 11 13 year old they're able to think abstractly. They can tell time, um, they can reflect, whereas a five or a six-year-old will not be able to do some of those, um, uh, you know, more uh, abstract or reflective thinking. All right, so that kind of ends our session for this. Um, join us. Oh, yeah, we'll look to see if there are any questions here quickly. Let's see. So there's a question that says, I understand meeting the student's need. However, there are testing expectations. 
during the school day year? How can we slow it down? That's a great question. And so as I speak to um, school staff, um, you know, they have to reconcile. Um, the, the administration and the principals have to reconcile that, um, you know, we develop curriculum sequentially. So for, again, for those of you that are in education, you know that cur the curriculum is sequential. You have, to, you have to understand concept A before you can go to concept A plus one, and then A plus two and A plus three. And, and so, you know, teachers are under tremendous amount of pressure to, to you know, to meet um, testing uh, expectations and needs. But unfortunately, it's not going to happen. You know, if you have a fifth grader who academically or in math, they're in, in first grade, you have to teach them first grade concepts first, then second grade, then third grade, then fourth grade, and then fifth grade. It's just, it's, that's just the way the brain functions, and there's no way around it, okay? And so there's, there's nothing magical that we can do. We have to meet them where they're at developmentally. And I would add to that, um, there maybe should be a conversation with the school day teachers or administrators from the school day in what is the role of the after school program. Um, a couple hours after school, staff is not going to be able to make up those skill deficits if they exist um, with these kids. So having a reasonable expectation for what the after school program really is capable of doing and supporting with some of these kids, you know, maybe helping them to better learn how to self-regulate so that they are able to access um, their higher functioning brain might be a higher priority in after school and less focus on discrete academic skills. Right. You know, I mean, that's a decision that you have to make in the program that you are um, running, but right. just some food for thought. Yep, and just to clarify, because I, I read the question again, and, and, you know, we're not saying that you basically slow down the curriculum for everyone in the classroom. Um, differentiation means that, you know, if you have a classroom with five kids, uh -huh, ideally, right? <laughs> um, and you have, and they're all at different um, developmental levels. Um, differentiation basically says that, or states that we adapt our lessons to meet their individual needs. Um, and so the days of basically lecturing to, you know, one whole group, and it, it you know, those have been over for quite a long time. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we don't, I'm not saying, you know, slow down the curriculum for everyone, um, just for the child that, 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 that needs it. Um, and that child will probably benefit from having maybe a mentor or a tutor. Again, that's someone that they can build that relationship with um, that then can maybe um, provide some of that support at their developmental um, stage. Yeah. Sorry, we're having a hard time seeing this little tiny screen for the <laughs> questions. Well, we see there's more questions, but we can't quite get them in our window, so we apologize that we're not. Oh, here we oh go. maybe we figured it out. There we go. Okay, so we have some, we see more questions, so we're going to try and answer them okay. quickly here. Was your star system after school connected to what they do, what they did school-wide? So for our example, it was not, um, primarily for two reasons. One, we initiated the positive behavior program in our after school program before the school day implemented there. So we were kind of ahead of the curve. Um, the other reason is we are an off-site program. Um, and so we're not uh, directly affiliated with our local school district. If you are able to um, connect those, I think that's ideal. If you can um, mirror what's going on in the school day in your after school program, I think then you're just continuing to reinforce the same language, the same behaviors, and I, I think that that would be um, the best case scenario. If you're not able to, I think you can independently implement your own system. Right. And I think it is, in, if you, and the key is there if you can. Um, we know that um, the more consistent and the more, you know, if we create a common language, uh, the kids are going to function better. And so one of the things that we try to do with our foster care medical home is we try to bring some of those, um, that language that is used in the classroom to the home as well. 
um, so that if we have, you know, if we're using PBIS at home, after school, uh, and in school, then, then you know, that's three times that the children are hearing it, and, and there's something to be said for having that consistent um, uh, and those clear expectations for them. Oh, so um, maybe we can figure out on how we can put uh, an attachment or a handout with this for the four rules for our after school program. So we, um, what we have is be a star. And so the S is for safe, the T is for trustworthy, the A is for accountable, and the R is for respectful. Um, most kids had a general understanding of the safe, trustworthy, and respectful. The accountable took a little bit more um, teaching on our part so that kids clearly understood. Then accountable means that you do what you say, that if you make a commitment to somebody that you follow through, um, that you come to the after school program with your homework, with your assignment notebook, and it's completed so that staff know what it is that you're working on each day. Um, so we did clearly lay out what all of those behaviors included, um, but the accountable one did take a little bit more effort on our part. And coming from a, a elementary school background too, that you know we have some of the schools that I was at, they, they kind of simplified it to um, being safe, being responsible, being respectful, mm -hmm. um, and being kind were, were you know, four of the ones that, that were used. And then under each of those, you just have to list mm -hmm. um, area specific, you know, so being responsible in the art room is different, slightly different than being responsible in the cafeteria or being safe in the art room, slightly different than being safe in the cafeteria. And so you just, you know, the, the key is that when you implement these, um, these rules or these expectations, that they have to be clear to all children um, and so again, you want to use that, you know, keep it simple uh, principle, uh, and it, it works best. You know, otherwise, if we use language that uh, children don't understand, or if it's too wordy, uh, too abstract, uh, it's not going to be as successful as if you can uh, clearly state those expectations and maybe limit them to, a, you know, to a certain degree too. If you have a laundry list of things that are under responsible, that you know, it's hard for kids to 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 maybe focus, you know, to to process all of them. So maybe focus on a few uh, and you can address some of those year to year too. Right. And I would also encourage you just to do a web search. There is a Wisconsin PBIS network um, and their web page is a wealth of resources. So they have example lessons and um, signage, whatever, whatever resources you might be looking for. So Wisconsin PBIS network um, would be a great place for you to gather some additional information. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, our next session will be May 10th, and we're going to be looking at um, some strategies, uh, relationally mediated strategies, so things that are going to be guided by your staff. And then we're also going to go over how to teach and practice mindfulness uh, in the after-school setting. So thanks again, and we hope to uh, have you join us in the next one.